Good evening, guys. Brian Newbert here from uh, goldenblack.com. Here in the old home content hut, uh, Mike Carmen went to College Park today to cover Purdue's 68-54 to loss at Maryland. I'm sitting right here, and I can talk about it on video while he does all his writing and stuff. Um, thank you to the Purdue Club Hotel for your promotional support of these silly little rap videos I do. We appreciate it very much. Um, you know, these are long seasons, and, you know, Purdue was bound to have a rough patch here and there. Um, and it's finally come. It's come in the back half of the Big Ten season. Stands to reason that everybody else has had kind of the whole season to figure Purdue out to a certain extent. Um, a lot of these teams have seen Purdue already in person, probably have a better idea of, of – how to grapple with them, uh, figuratively and literally. Uh, and, uh, that this didn't happen earlier in the season remains kind of a minor miracle. Uh, it's probably a positive thing that Purdue didn't hit this little rut. If you want to call it a rut, um, until after it had a pretty robust lead in the big 10 race, after it had its place in the NCAA tournament and after it had a really nice seed, pretty much locked up, those are all positive things. That said, you don't want to get in position to win the Big Ten and then not do it again like you did last year. So, uh, you know, Purdue's got to finish this off the right way. But this was uh, this was not a, a great evening uh, for Purdue. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a guy here sitting at home watching these games on TV. Uh, and if you want my opinion on this game and why it unfolded the way it did, I think Purdue... Uh, lost its composure uh, because I think the fact it got cheated at Northwestern uh, got between its ears. And I think, you know, obviously Maryland's run started with Mason Gillis's technical foul, which was a clear lashing out at, of course, an official. And I think that might have given you a little bit of a look into what's sort of, sort of bubbling under the surface with this team right now. And uh, I think that they flat out got ripped off at Northwestern. I think the missed calls probably numbered in the dozens. And if like three, three of those calls get made, you know, Purdue wins that game and knocks Northwestern out of the big 10 race. Whereas Northwestern is now solely in second place. And I, I think it's, it's sort of the officiating last couple of games. And again, I'm not, um, I'm not making excuses for all this stuff, even though it sounds like I am. And I'm, I've never been blamed the officials guy, but you know, the last, three or four games, it seems like things have been entirely different than they were the first half of the season when Purdue, I don't think, had many gripes with the officials. I, I think they did a pretty good job with Zach Eady for the most part. Not perfect. I don't think you're ever going to be perfect with a player like him. But I think that they did well enough. And I think that was a big part of the reason why Purdue was, you know, 23-1, uh, and one, whatever they were, or something like that. Um, 22 and one, uh, whatever the actual record was since then, especially on the road, it's been, it, it's been just, uh, it's just been octagon basketball. And I think part of what I meant before, when I said sometimes teams kind of, kind of figure, figure you out through the course of the season. What I mean by that, it's not just about guarding Zach Eady on offense, uh, and you know, getting like two out of every five fouls you commit called, but it's doing the same thing on the offensive glass. When you look at Purdue's body of work this season and the importance of offensive rebounding and second chance opportunities for Purdue, that's a huge part of the reason why Purdue spent most of the year as one of the most efficient offenses in college basketball. That's kind of going by the wayside here a little bit lately when you look at the point totals and things like that. And that's because the offensive glass is being uh, is being the advantages of the offensive glass are sort of being taken away from Purdue. You can go on the internet and you can find the screen caps from the Northwestern game of them locking arms around Zach Eady. You can find clips of, of them face guarding Zach Eady, which is illegal. Uh, you can go back to this Maryland game and there was that one play uh, where you see Zach Eady go up with one arm and his other arm is being held down by Julian Reese. Someone's going to get hurt. If the officials, you know, aren't going to call this out of the spirit of competitive integrity and, you know, the letter of the rule book, you know, they should at least make sure that they're looking out for the player's best interests. And, you know, 
if Chris Collins and his staff sanctioned his players locking arms around Zach Eady, that should be a Northwestern issue. That should be a Big Ten punishment issue because that is that is dangerous and that is irresponsible and that is that is a dereliction of head coaching duties uh, in terms of protecting your players. It's also it doesn't reflect well on the officials uh, that th- that was allowed to happen. Um, you you just can't have all of this arm fighting going on on the boards before somebody ends up with a cracked elbow. And Purdue would know as well as anybody because that rule is in place because of Purdue. Yet this stuff still goes on. It's not like there's never been a Zach Eady in college basketball. There was one at Purdue just a few years ago. Um, but I think Purdue is really getting bent into shape about the, uh, the officiating. And I think that led them to come into this game playing really angry. And I think sometime in that second half, angry transitioned into uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, I don't want to say discombobulated. I want to say like uh, just completely. Uh, they completely lost their cool. I can't do this without um, more words than I thought I needed. Anyway. They completely lost their cool in the second half. They completely lost their composure. And uh, you saw what happened. Uh, Purdue's just got to steady itself here. Um, They have to hope for some help uh, from the officials on the egregious stuff on the offensive glass as much as, you know, the fact that Zach Eady gets fouled so much on offense. Uh, I think um, we'll see. Uh, You know, the the, the Northwestern game created a little bit of... uh, uh, competitiveness in the Big Ten race now. It has reshaped the race, and, uh, you know, Purdue's got to hang on here uh, by any means necessary, and uh, we will see if they can do that. Part of also I think what's been figured out about Purdue is the importance of Fletcher Lawyer, and I thought that, uh, you know, early in the season I kind of figured Purdue or Purdue opponents would really, really kind of beat him up and make the officials call it and I don't know if they ever really did. I think they made him work. I think they were physical with him, but I don't think they're doing what they're doing now. Uh, I think I can count off the top of my head here uh, four times where he was hip-checked or otherwise firmly contacted, and I think one of them was called a foul. I think there were two early on that were, that were, were clear fouls that weren't called. There was another one that, that was probably 50-50 that was called a tie-up. And then there was the, the the fourth one that was called. Now, it's kind of the opposite of Zach Eady. Just because Zach Eady is built to take contact doesn't mean it's not a foul when he's contacted. Just because Fletcher Lawyer isn't built to absorb contact yet at this point in his career, that doesn't mean that when he gets contacted and not knocked off his line, and in some cases his feet, that that's not a foul. Uh, and I think people are starting to understand that he's sort of that that Sasha Stefanovic type of secondary scoring threat that if you can take him away, you sort of take away that that first that first path to losing. And, and that's that's him making a bunch of shots early and um, really changing the game from the outset and then having to worry about Zach Eady. Um, so Purdue's just got to kind of plow through this. They just kind of have to make the best of this. I don't think the officials are just going to all of a sudden say, okay, Purdue, we took one away from you at Northwestern. Now we're, we're, going, to, we're going to give you one against Indiana, uh, or we're going to give you one against uh, at Wisconsin or something like that. It, it does, I don't think it works that way. Um, nor, nor should it even be a situation where, you know, we're talking about a game being sort of taken away from them at Northwestern. Um, but it kind of is what it is, you know, bad officiating is part of basketball and, uh, it, it's been a part of, of the big 10 race here the last couple weeks. And, uh, you know, Purdue's just going to have to get better because of this, you know, as good as Purdue's been all season long, there has still been a lot of room for improvement. They've got to keep people out of transition. They've got to stop turning the ball over and, uh, they've got to shoot consistently well. And they obviously did not shoot well, um, at Maryland, that was part of this too. Um, it was funny that Purdue's two leading scorers were guys who came up in grassroots using Under Armour basketballs. Braden Smith 
who played for an Under Armour program, and Zach Eady, who pl who's Northern Kings program, played in the open division on the Under Armour circuit uh, using Under Armour balls. Anyway, that's a fun fact you probably didn't need to know because it's completely irrelevant to the outcome of this game. But Purdue is, you know, for the first time this season, really looking kind of vulnerable. Um, and I, I think they're, they're still what you thought they were. I, I don't think that really, I don't think things like that really change. Um, you know, contrary to the nature of, of hot boards and, and power rankings and top 25 plus ones, teams kind of generally are what they are. They play better at, at, at some times than others. I don't think Purdue is, you know, Purdue for the last game and a half has played, played well enough to win both of those games. It was just the final 15 minutes of this game. I think they were good enough to win at Northwestern. They just didn't get three or four more calls that should have been made. Um, and a lot more went into it than that. They've got to stop turning the ball over. They have to stop tur turning the ball over. they got to keep their composure. They have to be strong with the ball. Part of this stuff, too, is the nature of having one point guard on your team. That is something that, you know, was a worry coming into this season. Maybe not within Purdue's walls, but a reasonable thing to worry about for people on the outside. And I think it has shown up a little bit uh, here uh, the last few weeks. Um, but that's something that's been there all season. And I think that Purdue just has to has to keep getting better. I think that was the case before they were losing games. Uh, and I think that's the case now that they've been losing games. So, uh, you know, Purdue's still in a pretty good spot here, um, you know, to at least share the Big Ten title. I know that's not necessarily what everybody wants, but um, just have to uh, – you just don't want it to come down to that 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 Indiana game being an all-or-nothing type of deal. Um, I also have Northwestern pegged for like a three-game losing streak any time. Now, once they finally have to have to leave their home floor, um, it'll be interesting to see how Purdue plays on Sunday. Uh, they got to – they got to keep their stuff together. Um, you know, uh, they can't let this snowball the way I think the Northwestern game snowballed into the Maryland game. So uh, that's kind of what I got. Um, that was probably my least coherent, most rambling uh, rap video in quite some time. Um, so, uh, so once again, uh, following Purdue's loss at Maryland, uh, this is Brian Newbert from goldenblack.com. Stay tuned to our site all night for Mike's coverage from Maryland, and uh, I'll talk to you again on Sunday after Purdue plays Ohio State. Um, I might actually be in the arena for that. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. So thank you, everybody.